Hello and welcome to a new round of the Archine XP online training courses. My name is Zoltan Tot and I'll be your host to show you what Archine has to offer. A couple of words about me, I'm working as the partner manager of Archine XP and I'm also a CAD and modeling enthusiast, so in my spare time I love to discover CAD software programs in general and I like to recreate historic and traditional famous buildings in our software. So. For that reason, we decided that we are going to make a show which is not only about how to create interior spaces, but I'm also going to talk about the little tips and tricks I picked up along the couple of years I've been working with ArchLine. So what are, what are we going to have today is, in, is an introduction to the interior design feature set of ArchLine XP. And actually, this is going to be a course, uh, several courses actually, which are going to take a look from the from the beginner's perspective into what Arshine has to offer. Obviously, first we are going to look at the baby steps. How do we get started? And uh, I don't want to bore you with details, so for that reason we are going to build up a uh, family house's reception room. And then we look at the basics, how to draw lines, how to make measurements. And then we look at bathroom design, tiling, quantity takeoffs, and how to use uh, bathroom appliances. Then comes kitchen design, which is all about uh, making furniture pieces, paneled furniture, and also using home and kitchen appliances. Then comes the quantity takeoffs, schedules and tags, because the, that session is going to be all about documentation. Eventually, we look at the lighting and light sources issue. What makes a good rendering? What makes a good lamp? And lastly, we are looking at visual design and rendering, which will show you how to make good rendered images. But everything starts in the beginning, and that's what we have today. So today we get started with a very simple um, living room design. Before we get before we get anything, you know, on the way, let's talk about what is the software that we are going to use for this course. The software is called Ocean XP, and that is a family of products which is targeted for. Um, any kind of design work, whether you're working on architectural models or uh, any other building elements, then this is the software you could be using. And this is a CAD software. Now, I always make this disclaimer because when people hear CAD software, then they might go like this, which is actually my approach. I was very bad with mathematics and geometry back in school. So whenever I see a CAD software, bunch of lines and text and annotations and command lines and whatnot, I always run scared like Scooby-Doo in that famous cartoon series. Well, we are not going to look at that. We are not going to, to show you what's under the hood. Instead, we are going to be what, what I like to call uh, creation and modeling oriented. Uh, think about modeling as when you are creating a clay pot or you create something with your hands. You get your hands dirty for sure, but you enjoy what you do. So instead of instead of actually trying to understand what makes a line or how you draw a very simple group or two dimensional polygons, instead we are going to look at modeling. So we are not going to bore ourselves with this. Instead, we are going to look at how to create that. That being said, uh, let's get started. In if you go to our website to www.arshanxp.com and if you go to the to the webinar series website, I'm just going to share my screen to show you what we have here, then you can actually see the courses that we have planned for these next couple of days. And here you can download the webinar files and the course guides. Um, yeah, just my Archtime version just opened. So you can download the, the files from our website and the course guide as well. So that way you can follow along to our courses. Now, let's get back to the software itself. This is what we are actually going to cover. Uh, a very simple yet effective and I think rather nice uh, living room design. This is not my design per se. This was uh, made by one of our uh, one of our clients and I'm very grateful for the for the project that she sent to us. And uh, what we are going to do, we are discussing how to make this very simple room with the furnishing pieces over there. If you have any questions, uh, then you can ask your questions along the way and at the end I'm going to do my best to answer them. And you can follow along for sure, but you don't have to worry. This course is going to be available once the live show is over. So if you want to go over the details once again, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to use the latest version of Arshan XP, but the free trial version of 2020 is available to everybody. So if you want to get the most up-to-date version, go for a trial and then get. let's get to it. So this is where we get started. This is the final result, what we are hoping to achieve, but that's not where we start, of course. So we just go to file and open up a new project and we quit without saving and we end up with this this is the view where you can actually find the older projects that you have but we are not reaching back to an older project instead we are going to go for a new and clean one so that's where actually it gets 
you know, gets done. So this is where you're actually going to work. A quick recap of the interface. I'm not going to show everything because we are going to discuss things as we go, but just to give you an idea. So up here, you find the tools that you would be using most frequently. Tools for architecture, interior design, drafting, dimensioning, and documentation. Over here on the left, you will see our design center and the material and object properties. Uh, this is going to be very relevant later on. Over here on the right, there are two very important things, the project navigator and the help. The help is always going to show you the tool and teach you more about the tools that you are using. Uh, the project navigator, we are not going to use that uh, that frequently. So we are just going to go uh, let it go hide into hiding. If you want to uh, show it, you have to click on this pin button, but otherwise it's going to go into hiding. If your software doesn't uh, look this way, then you can go to view user interface and reset everything to the factory default, which is one of the tools I, I fell in love with in the first place. You just click on this thing and everything goes back to normal. I wish more things would be like that. So um, let me just pull up my cheat sheet because uh, there are so many numbers that I have to remind myself what we are going to do. So how do we get started? There are several ways actually. If we go to the building menu, you can uh, create a drawing made of walls. Before we do anything, let's just right click on the walls and see its properties. We see a wall which is 2,700 millimeters, right off the bat. Let's stop right here. Uh, I'm currently working in millimeters and here you can see that it's in millimeters as well. If you want to change it to something else, you can do that in the settings menu. So you just go to the settings, this cogwheel and go units and angles. And here you can override that, but I'm going to use it in millimeters for now. So let's go back to the walls, right click properties. And here I can define how high my walls I want to be and how thick they should be um, for this. For now, I'm fine with that. So let's just hit OK. We are working with a predefined room shape. I'm not going to sketch the room because that might be a little bit time consuming. So instead, I'm just going to pick a room shape and I can do that with the interior room maker predefined rooms menu. Right off the bat, I start with a rectangle and all I have to do, I just have to type in the values. Let's say I want to have a 6,000 uh, times uh, 3,900 millimeters room. Then this is what I end up with. I'm just going to submit 7,160 and 3,900 is fine. Updates, hit close, and now I end up with a room. Let's talk about navigation. There's a 2D and there's a 3D part. When you are in 2D, you can navigate by scrolling in to zoom in and scroll out by zooming out. Uh, pushing the scroll key and moving your mouse, you can navigate around, you can pan around, and if you have moved quite far away, then double click with the mouse scroll and the model would be fit back to screen. If you want to work in the 3D, which you can do anytime you want, you activate the 3D and activate this button right here, which magnifies the window, which is in focus. Now zooming in, zo zooms in with the scroll, zoom out, scroll out. If you want to rotate your model, you just push the right click on your mouse and move your mouse. If you want to orbit around your model, push the mouse wheel and the shift key, and then you can orbit like that. So this is basic navigation. Um, if you want to pan, hold the scroll key and move your model. Now let's go back to the 2D, activate it, because this is where we are going to do most of the work uh, right now. Um, there are two extra sort of extrusion from this model. There should be one bay here and another one there. So how do we create that quickly? We go to the building, edit, and uh, square add-on menu. And here I can add the, the two uh, add-ons. There should be one here, another one there. Uh, the add-ons uh, sizes are, I just have to look at the cheat sheet. The width, uh, the A value should be 3000 and the B value, the depth should be 2240. By the way, if there any of this is not understandable, let me know and I will explain further. So now I have a shape which I can add to my drawing and I'm just going to snap this green dot to the edge. And there you go. So one add-on is done. Okay, I want to add another add-on, but I don't want to go back to the menu over here and find the right tool. Instead, I'm just going to use right click and the software would offer the last command, which is a square add-on. This is what I'm pulling up and the add-on sizes should be, again, I go to my trusty cheat sheet. It should be 1,400 for, uh, for width and 500 millimeters for depth. And I just add, how do I add it properly? I mean, how do I position it from the from the wall corner? There's a tool for that. And I can do that by, by pushing basically the add-on to the wall and I see where it says nearest point. And then I can just type in the value 1,400 and then 
this value would be submitted. So this 1,400 comes from here. So, okay, I think my drawing is getting together, uh, but I have to sort of boost it somehow. I have to add a hole because I'm in a, um, a slab as a floor because I can see through this thing, so that's not good. I go to the building menu, slab, right click and go to properties. Now, this is where you can define how the properties of your slab looks like. I'm fine with the covering and I'm fine with the thickness and the, th and the base elevation. I'm not going to change that, but if you want to have multi-layered slabs or multi-colored ones, then this is where you can set them up. Let's just hit OK. I'm accepting this right now. So I'm just going to go to slab, slab by walls, highlight the whole drawing, hit enter, and then the slab is created. You don't have to manually track the drawing, you just have to highlight the whole thing, hit enter, and it is created. Same story with the ceiling. Now let's investigate how that is done. So I go to ceiling and plane O to ceiling, right click property again. I always like to fine tune things before I use them because then I don't have to go back and edit them. I like to do that before I get started. So two things I have to set up is the elevation of the ceiling, which is going to be 2,680 millimeters. And the representation in 2D, I don't want this, this uh, slash over here, so I'm just going to go with top view, and I think this is done. Okay, the, the ceiling is fine-tuned, so all I have to do, I go with ceiling, and plain auto ceiling, and again, uh, this sort of spider web appears, which recognizes the contour of the room, so if I hit click, then the ceiling is created. Okay, this is a, a dilemma for me, because, you know, I want to model things inside the room, but I can't do that, because there's a roof above my room, so I can I can see it. So if I scroll in, I can see anything. So for that reason, uh, we have a very very uh, effective tool, and that is called the Room Maker. Now, what does this do? Instead of telling you, I'm just going to show you. So if I click on the Room Maker again, the spider web appears, making us think that maybe it's another ceiling or something. But no, if I click, the software puts me inside the room where the usual navigation tools still work. So if I want to look around, I hold the right click and I just move around. I zoom in and zoom out. So nothing fancy appeared here. Then why should we use this? That's because if you, if you want to add doors and windows, you can position things much easily. Let me just demonstrate. This is the wall where I want to add, for example, a, a nice large sliding door. How do I do that? I'm going to use one of the tools from this palette. I'm not going to explain them right now what they are, instead I'm going to show you. So let's start with the first one, which is the door library. Here you can find the door what you want to use and you can put them onto the model. Let me just find the exact dimensions of this, of this door and that way I can use real world values instead of me finding out because actually this is a recreation of a room, so I'm not going to have to end up with, uh, you know, come up with a customized value. So I'm, I'm just going to hit back here, and I see that now I'm in my door library. This is the objects. These are the objects you can work with. So if I go to the door library and I go indoors uh, sliding, then I have an array of uh, sliding doors you can work with. There's quite a few, so I don't know which one is good for me. I have a note of that, so I'm just going to hit here, search in the in this in this folder, and I'm just going to say single-sided. And here we go. We have a single-sided sliding door. I click on it, it doesn't appear. Why is that? Because first I have to customize the width, which is going to be uh, 3,140, and the height should be 2,400. 2400 and let's just hit the this uh, check mark because that would position my door this is uh, not the right position so I want to push it towards this direction I want to want it to line up with the wall corner how do I do that I do that by clicking on the distance from the left or right and I'm just going to zero out distance from right hit the refresh button and the door nicely snaps to where it, go, where it should go. And notice this, this is very interesting. When you work on the room maker, whatever you do here, the 2D and the 3D updates. So you don't have to you know, go back and manually ref refresh these things. These things are going to be always in connection with your model. So you don't have to do things twice, which is when it comes to modeling is a huge time saver. So I'm just going to use this wall navigator to find the wall that I want to work with. That's the wall whatever I want to work. So I'm just going to move there just uh, just a second until I find it. I think that's wall number nine. So here I want to have a full uh, wall to wall or corner to corner sliding door. This one, again, I'm using the same model, but this time the width is going to be different. Um, I just have to put it to 3000 and the height should be 
2400 position it and then it appears I don't have to this time set up the 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 uh, corner distance because this magically fills up the from corner to corner so this is how you add the doors let's move on to windows um, story is the same with slight variations you have to take care of one extra data and that is the seal height which door sh which window should I use again I'm ended up with the library so I'm just going to say uh, I think mine is called window default or something like that uh, no that's not the oh, default window that's the one and the width and height I should customize the width should be 2000 millimeters quite a large one actually and the height should be 2100 and the seal height well I have to change that otherwise it's going to go all the way out to other space so I'm just going to say this is 300 and positioning it right so um, I think I might need to move it so let's just set the distance from the left wall corner to 800 millimeters um, here we go okay again I want to have a window next to this one which is going from here to the corner do I have to worry about the software overlapping windows no because if you create another window it's going to be always put into the place where it actually fits uh, let me show you how that's done so if you want to add another element of the same type to the same wall you have to click on the green plus icon <coughs> sorry and then you just have to fine-tune how the next object should look like the width should be a thousand and one hundred and the height should be 2001 that is fine seal is good okay let's position it nice so I could potentially move this further but I don't need to so that's that's what I wanted to end up with and there should be another window over here and that is if I look up the values I think it should be the same kind of values I'm just going to hit the the check mark but this time I have to snap it to the corner, which you, have, you might have guessed it can be done by zeroing out the distance from the left. Notice how I haven't used any command lines and any layers so far. So you might say this is not even a cat software. It is. Don't you worry about that. We are going to get that to that part as well. But I wanted you to, sh to show that uh, I wanted you to see that modeling is the is what's in focus. We don't want to. I shouldn't say understand the details. We should instead focusing on creating things. So doors and windows are done. What is the next logical uh, step? That is curtains. If I go to the curtain button, I can first define what kind of curtain type I want to use. Let's use this one. And then by clicking on the check mark, my curtain is created. Well, good thing about the curtain is, is that it has dynamic sort of properties which you can fine tune. So you can see how how many pleats you want to have or how, how uh, deep you want to draw this curtain in. I'm not satisfied with its values uh, for now, so I'm just going to change this to the height to 2680. And the bottom height, should this is the value what I'm talking about, should be 20. Okay, there we go. Um, fabric, well, this is not really good, so I'm just going to click on the paint bucket and find another material. Here in this list, you can find a jump list of materials. And here I can find what I look, I'm looking for the curtain 002. I think this is a bit better. Um, let's create another curtain next to this one. How do I do that? It's this list over here, this jump list. This navigates between the windows I have available. So I just click on the next window. Again, click on the this icon. Uh, I haven't copied the properties, so I'm just going to do them now. So I'm just going to say this is 20. And here we go. So this is how you can create another curtain above the other window. I'm just going to push this a little bit at the side. And that is what I am what I wanted to create. But what happens if you want to find another material, something which is not in this list? Well, generally speaking, Arch Linux comes with a, with a huge list of materials and colors. But uh, you have to keep in mind that the fashion changes much faster than our software does. So instead of finding new materials here, I always urge our customers to take a look around on the internet or in our own showroom. Now, what is the showroom? The showroom can be reached with this button over here by clicking on the showroom button. And this is actually a list of international manufacturers because if you are using something from this list, let that be an object or texture or any, anything like that, a painting maybe, then you can be sure that the element is 100% realistic. So you don't have to set up the material properties, sizes, anything. You just download what you need and then you use it. Uh, let me show you how that works. 
let's say we want to have a curtain type. You can find something from this list, but if you have the name, then you can just look for that. Uh, the name is Montreal underscore F underscore 105. And I'm just going to go with search. And the software tells me that this is the one I'm looking for. If I click on it, I see the manifestual data and some other elements from this same object uh, family. I'm just hitting download. And the software will download this object to my library. So if I hit on it, I think my curtain has just replaced its uh, properties, but I'm just going to move to the other curtain. And here I'm implementing this as well. So much better this way. Um, well, when it comes to fabrics, I'm not the guy to talk to because I usually don't see the difference in these things. But uh, it's always my wife who comes in and, and fine tunes my design when it comes to material properties and colors. But for now, this one would do. The next task is basically how to how to keep on coloring things. And uh, let me just go uh, on my cheat sheet and, and talk about wall colorings. Or before we do that, uh, I think the next step would be switches and sockets. Now, what we have to do, you might have already guessed it. First, we have to find the wall on which I want to work. And then I have to find the element I want to, uh, want to position. Let's, let me hit back and start with a socket. Uh, socket outlets, very standard European socket. If you want to use the English one, we have them here as well. Uh, I don't want to put one socket. Instead, I want to have three. So grouping should be three horizontal. And the base offset from the floor should be 300 millimeters because sockets should be closer to the floor. Uh, if it's too high, then, you know, cables will be hanging down. We don't want that. And we are just going to position that. And if we do that, the sockets appear. Nice. I can fine tune where they are, but I think I'm fine, fine with that. Next task is to position the, the um, switches, the light switches, which are to be found here. Later on, we are going to have some light sources, so we need to have switches for them hitting back and I'm just going to go with uh, with the switches uh, plate switches this uh, two-way switch would be fine again I need three and the base offset from the floor well since th this room is not going to be inhabited by kids only it's the switches should be higher uh, well kids should not have access to uh, to the switches and sockets anyway so let me just crank this up I think it should be um, one second 1200 and if I hit the check mark, then the switches appear. So this is how you position switches. Um, let me just close down the room maker for a second, because what you see is on the 2D, you can see the switches, uh, two dimensional symbols, which are very, which are very good because if you are later on going to uh, create a lighting plan or an electrical wiring plan, then you would need to have this kind of uh, symbols. Let's go back to the room maker, which can be done by interior room maker, um, room maker and click. This was just a very short side note. Next thing, we have to add the skirting board or cornicing or molding. I'm not sure how you call it, but these are the, the tools you can use for that. There are three positions for this kind of uh, profiles. On the top for the ceiling, in the middle, or at the bottom for the skirting. Now, let's start with the one on the, on the ceiling. And for that, we have a profile library. I'm just going to go with PX-022 but the sizes are not good. So I have to change that. The width should be 20 millimeters and the height should be uh, 100. And if I hit the check mark, the, um, the, the skirting or cornicing or, or crowning is created. I'm not fond of the material, so I have to change that by going into the paint bucket and finding the one, I don't want uh, it to be a wood colored. It should be something like that. Light gray would be fine. And the same applies for the skirting, which should be another profile. Uh, let me just find it real quick. Which one should that be? It's not here. So how do I find it? I'm going to the uh, for the um, blue X, the cross, and I go to the profile library and I'm looking for uh, the profile, what I need. It's called skirt uh, skirting board number six, I think. So I'm just going to find four, five, six. That's the one. So I'm just hitting OK. And then the width should be overridden. That should be 20 millimeters and the height should be 150. That's fine. Check mark again. I'm not fond of this material again. I, I never am. So I'm just going to change it to something else. So this is how you create uh, crowning and skirting board or, or cornicing, whichever name you use that use for it. 
Next task is to create the lamps. Now, what I'm doing now is something that you can do in the 2D and 3D as well. For now, we are doing it in the room maker because I want to show you how to position uh, lamps with, with ease. So I'm just going to clicking on the, the lamp button. And first, well, let's find the lamp what I'm what I want to use. I don't have anything in this list what I what I like, so I'm just going to hit the, the plus icon. And go into my lamp library. Uh, let's just go back to the lamps and find something. I think this delta light one would be good. Excuse the Hungarian naming. This is uh, one of the objects which uh, is made by a Hungarian manufacturer. What is this light bulb over here? Now this is interesting. Uh, if any element has a light bulb icon, it means that it's not only it doesn't only look like a lamp. It's going to give out light. Hit OK and position the light source um, with x and y values. This is like coordinates. Uh, I know that the x value is, is minus uh, 100, sorry, minus 100 and, uh, 1800. And the base offset from the floor, I think it should be fine. How come the light doesn't have any light, you know? Uh, well, this is because we are working in a 3D environment. Light comes at a later stage when you're rendering things. The software would be able to show the lights and the light patterns, but that would um, make work a bit slower because it would be heavier on your computer. So Arshine likes to um, to spare the resources. If you don't need the light sources now to, to, to emit light, then it's going to be uh, turned off. Later on, we can turn this on. But before that, we want to add another set of lights and that's going to be a spotlight. And for that, again, we hit the green icon and the light should be a spotlight. It's not here, so I'm just going to go to lamp and the name is grid in two. There we go. Um, X and Y position. This is a uh, difference. So it's this time it's going to be uh, zero and zero. And I'm just going to position it there. There's only one copy of this. So I want to have six. How do we do that? Well, you could do that in the room maker, but let me just show you a shortcut. This is a trick we picked up along the way. So let me just uh, quickly find the relevant uh, part and show you how to actually make an array of, of lamps. Um, this comes at a later stage in your course schedule, but I think it would make more sense to actually show you now how it's doable because in the software, you are able to sort of multiply things using the edit, duplicate, and matrix tool. Unfortunately, this has nothing to do with the classic Keanu Reeves movie, uh, but what it does is that it's going to make um, an assortment of lamps. So just click on the element you want to uh, you want to copy, um, find the picking point, and then decide how many you want. I want to have three horizontal and two vertical, and the values, I think this, this ones are good. So with this, you can define how dense you want the assortment to be, and you just hit OK, and define where you want to position your lamps, click and the lamps are created. So that's just a quick side note to show you that if you want to multiply things, you can do that. Now, let me go back to the room maker and back to our uh, our course schedule because there's a bunch of things I haven't told, told you before. I just wanted to have this very tiny side note. Uh, let's talk again about um, lamps because what we haven't discussed are the wall lamps. I need one here and another one there. Again, what we do is that we go to the lamp menu and find the wall lamp. This one is fine. And the I need to define their uh, properties. First of all, I want the the sort of distance from the left and right to be to be accurate. So this one this one would be four hundred from the left, and the base offset from the floor should be a thousand five hundred. Hit the green button, and the lamp is created. I need to have another one, so I just click plus. Properties are the same except for the distance from the from the right, which would which would be a thousand millimeters. Okay, fine. So the wall lamps are now good. Next thing, uh, what is the next button over here? That is actually the picture on the wall uh, icon. Now with this, you can add decorational elements and paintings on your wall. So let me just find one of the walls which are sort of hidden. I want to give this wall some kind of accent. So how do I do that? First, we need to find the picture we want to look for, uh, we want to see. I think I'm going to use this um, this one uh, from Arunas Zilis. Uh, one of my Lithuanian viewers might be able to correct my pronunciation. He's a very famous uh, contemporary painter from uh, from Lithuania, and he's creating nice 
brightly colored, mainly yellowish um, oil paintings. So how do I put this onto this um, this sort of surface? First, I want to have a frame, but matting I do not need. The base offset from the floor, uh, is this good? I don't know, so let's just hit the check mark. No, it's too high, it's, it's pushed into the ceiling. So the base elevation should be 1,200. Let's just hit the refresh button, and now we ended up with a nice, nice painting. Uh, that's one way to do it. Let me show you the other one. And for that, we have to navigate back to that big wall with the with the wall lamps. Uh, I think it's over there. Yeah, I want to have a nice map over here. Why a map, you ask? Well, I like to have maps on the wall. It's sort of, especially if they are older maps, uh, they show you like a sense of tradition, showing that, that things happened before we came around and things happened and, and people lived and, and prospered before we inhabited this earth. I know it's a bit sentimental uh, thinking, but I like to sort of see these things, the material evidences of people living in the past. So what I do is that uh, I disable the frame. I don't need that. And the width and height I have to change. The width should be 1,200. And the, I'm sorry, uh, that's not the actual width. I just have to keep on scrolling in my uh, agenda because the width is going to be 200 and, uh, 2,200. And the height should be 2,450. Distance from the left. I don't want this painting to overlap with any of my lamps. So this would be 850. And the base offset from the floor should be 150. And if we hit OK, then all we have on the on the wall is the uh, the map of London from 18. 32 quite a nice one it 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 goes with the style of of my uh, skirting board and cornicing but it's not really going with the flooring so i need to change this flooring asap otherwise it's going to have a very bad effect so by clicking on this button i can pull up the different um, covering styles but i th i just go with this oak truffle colored i think this goes much better with uh, with my my painting so this one is uh, is fine Next thing I have to set up is the wall covering because so far everything is whitish. You might not want that. So let me just go to one of the walls and change its covering. Or better said, how do we change the covering for all the walls? All I have to do, I have to go to my material library. Uh, I don't have anything I like here. So I'm just going to hit the plus icon and look for light gray and find it. Hit OK and say all walls click on it and all the walls are changed. But uh, let me circle back. This accent wall is not good this way because this should have a different, like a darker tone. So this painting would really be, you know, emphasized. So what do we do then? Um, we go back to where we started here, but this time I have to remove the check mark and go to the material library and find another texture. This should be black blue, I think. And here we go. This time only this wall changed. So that's exactly what I wanted to uh, end up with. I'm going to close the room maker for now. Uh, and here's the problem. How do I get into this model? Whatever I do, let me just magnify it. Whatever I do, I never get inside. So why is that? That is because we are working in a view which is called axonometry. Axonometry means that wherever you are, distances would never get shorter. If we would physically stand here, we would see these two uh, lines to, uh, to get closer to each other with distance, but this is not the case. This is um, um, an axiometric view, which is good for planning things, but when it comes to interior design, you have to rely on something that we call the perspective views. If you click on this eye icon, the perspective view appears. Uh, first thing where we have to realize is that this is where we are, this is where we look, and this is how wide we see. So if I click on the this item over here, I can drag where I actually am. Why does my floor plan looks like this? This is because the representation is changed. So I have to click on this button to have a proper 2D view and not a top view. So let me just move this marker inside my room and turn my head like this. So this is what I want to see. If I'm fine with this, I uh, click on the plus icon and then I can name my viewpoint. Now, how should we set up these viewpoints? Well, first it's good practice to have the the Z value uh, where we actually are the height uh, to have the same height as our eye level. Um, mine should be 1700. I think I'm shorter than that, but this one would be fine uh, because that would give you a bit more realistic uh, viewpoint. 
Then we have to double click and name the views. I think it should be uh, reception room 001. And if I want to have another perspective, all I have to do, I change where I am. I change what I'm looking at and hit plus again and should be uh, reception room reception room zero uh, zero two okay I think I'm fine with that I'm not going to make more of these but very important that if you want to toggle between these views you can use these keys down the up and down keys or you can just punch the page up and page down keys and that way uh, your position in the room would be moved uh, important you see this marker over here this is where you can fine tune where your perspective actually is. Just grab onto it and move it wherever you want. And if you like this, then you can save this view as an additional one. So um, using perspectives is very important for creating visuals because the rendering is never realistic in an axonometry. Uh, moving on, there's a couple of things we have to clean up. And one of these things is the corner window. Let me just move my perspective over here. This is a mess. So this is not good. How do I make the divider, the mullion, disappear? Uh, for that, we have a tool, and that is in the building or window, window on wall corner, and join two openings to be a, at the wall corner. And all I have to do is select one of the windows and the other one, and the, the connection is created. But at the same time, the window would be moved. So if I move here, I see that here now is a divider. I don't need that. So I'm clicking on the window and change its size to be original. Yeah, the other window I'm not going to mess around with, but this one is fine for my purposes. That's very good. Uh, so the windows are fine. I, I don't like the curtain here. I need to trim it back. So how do I do that? It's very important to make a note here. Wherever you are creating things, in the room maker, in the 2D, 3D, it doesn't matter. Things would be editable at a later stage anytime. So if I click on this uh, curtain, I can trim it back even though it hasn't been created in the 2D but I can trim it back anytime in the 2D as well. This is very important to know. Later on, I'm going to show you much more than that, but for now, this is the important thing to know. Okay, another thing. What if I want to change the texture of these windows? How do I do that? Do I need to go back to the, to the, um, to the room maker? Well, not exactly. Um, I need to... I need to go, so I could go obviously back to the to the, um, to the the room maker, but I don't need to, because if I go to the material uh, palette here on the left hand side, uh, remember in the beginning I started with this uh, part, what the interfaces mean. Uh, I should just need to look for something. I'm looking for a material, this wood powder would be fine. Drag and drop onto the surface. Now when I do, when I dra drag and drop something onto the, uh, to the window, then two choices appear. One is that replacing the material with another. Now, what does this do? This would override every single instances of, of this material with this one. But if I go with only on this object, then only on this window, it would be changed. But I'm just going to go with on another and click and every single instances would be changed. I think this is fine. May later on, I might change it back, but for now, I'm fine with that. So again, if you want to change something, click, drag, drop and that way you can change things. Now, let's talk about uh, how do we basically furnish this floor plan. This doesn't have that much things going on. So let's just find a good view. Um, oh, by the way, um, if you use the page up and page down keys in the 3D, then the software navigates between the, uh, the perspectives. But if you use the same key in the 2D, then it navigates between the floors. Now we only have one floor, so this makes no sense, but I just wanted you to, to know that if you somehow made the floor plan disappear, there's, there are two things to know. One, hit double click because that moves the model back to the view. But if it's still not, not appearing, just move the page up and page down keys and then the model should appear. I think, yeah, here we go. Um, Okay, so let's populate the floor plan with some objects. And for that, we have we have several ways to do it. So just like with materials, um, you can either add things from our own object library, or you can reach out to external libraries such as the 3D warehouse or the BIM libraries that we have. We are going to look at them at the next course. Uh, for now, we are going to use whatever is inside the program. Start with something that uh, something we can sit on, something which is in the center point of this room. Uh, let's look for a sofa, husk, sofa, 
Um, I think ask sofa maybe. I think it, it doesn't have to have. Yeah, it doesn't have to have uh, dashes. So I'm grabbing the element, dragging and dropping it onto my floor plan. Okay, where do I put it? Where do I snap it? Uh, well, for now, let's just position it. There are several problems with this sofa. For now, uh, it's facing the wall, so that's not good. So how do we amend that? We click on the 2D, magnify the window, click on the sofa, and I have two rotation markers. One of the markers, if I click on it, it allows a free rotation of the element. So if you want to rotate it like this, you can do that. I don't like that, so I just want to undo this, which you can do by the undo button up here or by pushing Ctrl Z. Okay, another way to rotate things uh, is click on the element and click on the moving rotation and the other, other rotation marker, rotate 180 degrees and there we go. Okay, I don't like where it is. I want to move it closer to the to the wall. How do I do that? Click on one of the edge markers and move it closer to the wall. And I can just snap it actually on the wall or just put it here. Uh, okay, this is not good. Let's say that we are, uh, that I'm a cat person, which I'm not, but let's assume that I am. I want to have some kind of gap between the sofa and the wall so the cat would be able to go. So I'm just going to hit the wall and hitting the control key, I'm clicking this sofa. And now the software tells me that currently there's only two centimeters gap between the two elements. If I click on this marker, I can say I want it to have a hundred millimeters. And that way you can move things or you can uh, sort of distance things from each other. So again, click on one element, click on the other one by holding the control key, and then you can control how um, far things are away from each other. Now, what are we going to do in this room? We are going to watch TV from this, uh, from this element. So for that, we need to have for example, a some kind of um, TV stand, which would be this one. So again, what we do, we drag it, uh, drop it. I want to snap this element to the wall, but I can't do it because the snapping point is in the top right corner of this, top left corner of this element. So by quitting on the F5 key, or just clicking on the next reference point, I can find the point which is on the bottom, and then I can just snap things. Let me just move it closer. I think, yeah, um, this is not going to work that way. It's going to push it to the other side, so I'm just going to put it there. Uh, move it a bit because it's under the the window, so I think this is fine. And I need to have a TV on this. So how do I do that? I go to the to the object library, and I think I need to have a wall TV. I think that will be fine. Position it and put it. Uh, okay, there are two things. Uh, not good with this model. Let me show it in the, in the 2D, 3D I mean. One problem is that it's actually turned away from us and that I can amend again by clicking on this button and rotate it 180 degrees. Another and bigger problem is that this element is on the ground. Why is that? That's because the default values of this TV is, is that it should be on the, on the snap to the ground floor and that's not good. So if I click on the TV, I have two choices. I can either click on this rotational marker and move it up or I can just go to the properties and add the base elevation and the base elevation uh, this is not something I know so I'm just going to use the marker so I'm just going to move it a little bit higher and again the object is a bit a bit a little bit far away from the wall that's not really realistic so I'm just going to go back to the 2d uh, select the element and move it snap it to the wall so that's how you do that uh, another thing I need to have is a bunch of um, sort of footrests and the table and other things. If you don't mind, I'm not going to do that because I have a final stage of this model, which we are going to use for rendering. So what I what I, what I would have done is that you could have just added more objects, you know, rinse and repeat, drag and drop elements, move them, rotate them, resize them if you want. But for now, we are just going to jump into another uh, instance of this project, which is the finalized version with uh, all the objects ready. I'm not revealing a big secret if I say that this uh, this project has not been done by me. So that is to say it's much more elaborate than what we have time for in about 45 minutes. But to be honest, in 45 minutes, we managed to end up with, uh, with something spectacular. But this is the end result. Again, if you want to look around, right click and move your mouse button. OK, I think this is fine. Let's navigate around and see my views. Uh, page up and page down navigates between the views. Uh, this is fine. What about creating a few renderings? How do we how do we create one? Well, 
first of all, there are three things you need for a good rendering, and these are three sort of golden rules. One is that you should have a good perspective because you want to know what you want to show. You want to have a very realistic uh, outcome, something what is believable that this is actually a real world uh, environment. The other thing you have to set up is the material properties. Later on, I will show you that in another course. And the third thing is the lighting and the light sources. I am going to talk about la lamps as a, at a later stage, but one of the light sources, which is very evident that it's there, is the sun. So how do we turn on the visibility of the shadows? So how do we see what kind of uh, sort of um, effect the sun has on my model? Well, first of all, we have to go to the 3D activated. And here on the left, you see this button over here, which toggles the shadows on and off. Now I see that I don't see anything. Why is that? That is because the sun is in a position where it, it's, it's not really lighting up my, my scene. So it's a good thing I didn't do a rendering because otherwise the sun would have been no um, character in my, in my design. So how do we change that? Uh, let's, let's go to the view button. And here I have a bunch of tools um, targeted for shadow uh, simulation and modeling shadows. So first let's start with sun and sun position. Here I have a predefined city list um, list of cities where we can actually position this, this model. This is going to be in Budapest, where I'm actually am right now. And the date should be, I think it's April um, 15th, I think it's today. Let me just, it's actually 16th. I'm never good with dates. Uh, and it's, it should be, what is the date today? Uh, what is the time? It's uh, 11.46, I think. So I'm just going to do it, 11.46, north direction. Well, I don't have that. Well, it's it's even no, it's not worse. It's uh, it's lighting up my scene from from behind. Uh, I don't like this shadow. I want it to to move somewhere else. How do I do that? I go to uh, shadow, and uh, I'm sorry, shadow simulation. Yeah, and here I can move my sun. I have the power over the the uh, sun, and I wanted to come up with a Latin name of the sun to sound even more professional, but I can't think of it. If you know it please leave it in the comments. So if you move the sun, you can move the time and the date of your scene and you can find the best results. So I think this is fine. This is, you know, giving me enough uh, sunlight to come in. Um, what happens if I want to show the shadows in movement because I want to pick the right date? Uh, I do that with, uh, sorry, with shadow and shadow animation. This looks like the same window as, as I used before, but only this time I can uh, choose that from what time until what time I want to see the shadows moving and in what kind of increments. I want to see every five minutes, preview, and now the software tells me that this is actually how the sun should look like. Okay, this is fine, I think. So for now, I'm going to turn off uh, the, the shadows. And before we start rendering, let's talk about uh, representation styles. That's something that we haven't talked, up, talked about before, but uh, it's worth mentioning. If you go to the 3D and click on this box over here, you see certain representation styles. Hidden line removal gives you a very cutting edge, white and clean design. Um, that's very good for conceptual kind of work. Wireframe does the same thing, only this time you end up with a bunch of lines because you have X-ray vision now. But where it becomes interesting is this realistic. Now, what does realistic do? Well, what it does is that it's still not a rendered image, so you don't, it's not realistic in, in photorealism sense. Instead, what happens is that materials which are the same would look differently on different surfaces. For example, the top of this uh, cabinet is darker than the side because that's how in real world it should, it should look like. If you want to have a consistent color representation, then everything goes back to the way it was before. Uh, this is better for sort of deciding what is the best texture or best color for that particular surface. Um, so again, these are the representation styles. If you don't have the same one as me, just keep on clicking on this until you find the right one you want to work with. I think we are done with this, but the question is, how do we sort of, how do we, make an image like that. That's that's what we want to achieve. And for that, there's rendering. Now, in ArchLine, first, what you do is that you set up the right sort of perspective. That is the no-brainer no one. I can fine tune it with this kind of um, marker. And then let's just put it to large screen and go with rendering with this orange button over there. Or you can achieve that by the view button over there. So when you go with rendering, 
there's there's a several settings. First, you have to decide on the resolution and what you want to see in the in the background. This is going to be a panorama, and uh, you have to decide how much background light you want, and if you want to have an exterior or interior render. For now, we go with exterior because it's quicker. So at the beginning, we don't want to spend too much time on this. We just want to have one image, which in a few minutes tells us how the end result should look like. Now the software loads up the rendering engine and the model would appear in a second. So once the model appears, there are several things you could do. Um, you could fine tune the, the uh, quality of the rendering or you can fine tune the background images or how light it should be. But the concept is the same. What is happening now is the software uh, sort of starts to calculate the light and how the surfaces would react to the light. You see that you, you end up with something uh, barely usable, something very darkish. Uh, I don't like that the background is not light enough and the, the thing is whole noisy. But you could, even at this stage, uh, emphasize certain elements with, with using the exposure tool or the brightness tool. So even, with, even when the rendering is not ready yet, you can fine tune how the end result should look like. I want to change the background, how, how light that is. So I'm just going to crank up the brightness a bit. But for that, I would need to restart the rendering. Not from the beginning though, it's just uh, the rendering itself. The transformation of the 3D model is already done, so I don't have to do that again. I think it's much better now, more light is coming in. So the end result is a bit better. Uh, and I'm going to have to go for an interior quick render, which is a higher resolution one. Again, um, stopping the rendering now, restarting it. And you end up with a better result right away. Um, now I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. This part of the webinar is pre-recorded because I don't want you to stay and watch until this thing renders. Uh, rendering is by nature is a time consuming process, but this is the way you can get photorealistic results, which you can save into an image file, which we are doing right now. So once you are done with the, with the result, you can just uh, hit the save button and uh, save it into an image, a PNG or JPEG image, which you can, uh, which you can send to your clients. Let me just do that real quick. Uh, find my folder and I'm just going to name my image something like the rendered webinar or something webinar rendering that's right hit save and uh, yeah i think i need to find the right folder otherwise it's going to go somewhere else i'm just going to save it into the same webinar folder and that way i can find it later on um you can fine tune these things obviously uh but at the stage this is what i want to have as a preliminary render Later on, if I want to fine tune it, I might end up with something much, uh, much more interesting. Um, it, it helps to crank up the resolution, of course. HD images are the industry standards, but with some work, this is what you can end up with from this thing. So that is actually what we wanted to cover during this, this session. And I'm very happy to see that actually there are some questions being asked. Okay, there's one, uh, there's one question right away is, uh, why are the window and door jams not in the same color as the wall? Okay, let's, let's go and, and see. Okay, when I was coloring the, the uh, <clears throat> sort of walls, then excuse me for just a second. I need to have a, need to have a glass of water. So the question is, uh, why is this white while the wall is not white at all? So uh, for that, there's a, there's a reason. When I was in the room maker and I was coloring things, the color for the walls was added like, uh, like an extra layer of covering. What does that mean? If I click on the wall and I go to its properties, I see that the wall uh, material is actually bright white. So why doesn't it look white? Why it's only white here? That's because the wall's face has been applied to a certain color, which is the that light gray um, underscore 47 or something. So even if I change this color to something else, this, um, let's say coffee cream, uh, nothing changes except for, for this part, because this part is overridden with a covering, a painting. If I right click on the wall, and I say, delete uh, all tiling, then it would be gone. So then everything would go back to normal. So that was the answer to your question um, regarding wall covering. So when it comes to covering things, there are two ways. You can color the original uh, object or you can use it as an underlay. Let me show you another example. If I go back to the uh, material settings and uh, let's, let's find another color, um, uh, bright white, for example. I want to cover this part 
And if I drag it and drop it, I have certain um, sort of choices. And if I'm not going to go with this, but instead I'm going to say add the bright white as a painting, then the same result is achieved. So this was painting and this is the object original color. So I hope, hope that was uh, that, that clarified the the idea what you have had in mind. Another question, uh, will the Russian language of the program will be added? Well, hopefully in the future. We are hoping that uh, as we proceed, there would be a Russian version of this, uh, of this um, program as well. Question, what materials properties can you edit to make the renders look like yours? Uh, okay, let's, let's talk about that real quick. I'm not going to spend too much time on that one because rendering comes at a later stage, but it's never hurt to get introduced to what makes a good material. So let's go with this light gray, for example, and let's uh, open up a, I, I can't do rendering that right now because that is going to crash the stream. So imagine that the rendering is running. So what happens here is that if you go to any kind of uh, material and click on this Cogbill icon and you go to settings, then you have the material settings and here under appearance you can find what the material should look like in a rendered environment. Um, these are called render styles and by choosing the right one you can say how the end result should look like if it should be a marbleish, uh, maybe a see-through material, maybe it should be wood-like. It's not going to change the color of the material, instead it's going to change the appearance. So the brightness, the scale, the bump mapping, reflection, refraction, and the blurriness. So this is where you can set things up. It takes time and effort to set things up to look like look nice on a, on a, on a rendered image. But that is the, the legwork you have to do. We try to, as you are going to see later on at later stages of this presentation series, we are trying to make things easier and automated, but there are things where manual work ends and art starts, if I may say so. Imagine or remember what I said in the beginning. Uh, we don't want this, we want, we want that. So we want to sort of be artists, right? So interior design is not only about moving in a bunch of furniture pieces, <clears throat> it's, it's also about finding the right look and the right feel. And uh, only one part of that is, is intuition, the rest is to be able to use the software to be able to get this result. Or, uh, or that one. So if you want to have that result, you have to be able to correctly manage and manipulate the materials. I think that's, uh, these are all the questions and let's talk about what happens next. Next, we are going back to the beginning. Why, you might ask? We already created something. We ended up with a, with a room. So why should we go back to the basics, the, the one one? Well, that is because we are going to, at a later stage, refer to things like lines, polylines, layers, floor structure, and uh, offsets and elevations, which should be talked about. And that's what we are going to discuss tomorrow uh, at the same time when we talk about the basics. Drawing walls, uh, adding elements such as um, doors, windows, annotations, measurements, dimensions, text and objects, and how to bring in objects from external libraries. Also, at a later stage, we are going to talk about imports as well. So now we are working on, uh, on a content which is already there. So I recreated something from scratch. But if you, if you have existing elements, such as PDFs, DXFs, or any kind of uh, file directories, you can use them in the software. And that I'm also going to going to show you at a later stage. So for now, uh, that's what we wanted to discuss. Thank you very much for tagging along for this presentation on uh, Archine XP and especially with a, with a very keen eye on how to create an interior design model from scratch. Uh, if you have any questions that I haven't, as, I haven't uh, answered, keep them coming in my email. So as you always do, just visit the website and write me uh, because these questions that you're asking are keeping the presentation much more relevant. Uh, for now, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, see you next time when we are going to talk about the basics of Watch NXP, lines, polylines. It's not going to be boring, I can tell you that. So thank you very much for your attention. See you tomorrow.